My views come from a particular time and place, namely Greece and from late 2002 to the present. Along with Dr. Nikos Katsaros, but independently, I seem to have been among the first in Greece to have started campaigning against the aerial spraying. On the island of Aegina, we held, as far as I know, Europe's first public meeting on the subject in July 2003. The municipal council of our island was the first elected body in Europe to attempt to take legal action. Of course, the information we were receiving was not from Greece. At that time, the most prominent name was the Canadian William Thomas, and we projected his film Mystery Lines in the Sky at our first public meeting. Like activists everywhere, including later the Belfort Group in Belgium, we focused our attention initially on the appearance of the sky. In Greece, we tried to secure an audience by participating in the action around climate change. But we found that we were marginalized when we tried to draw attention to what we were seeing in the sky. Here you can see us with our sign, Spraying from aircraft is not an answer to climate change, lost in the crowd at a mass demonstration essentially talking to ourselves. Given all this, it was encouraging when, in 2009, amidst the Climate Gate scandal that preceded the Copenhagen Climate Summit and contributed to its failure, we made the acquaintance of the Etc. Group, opponents of geoengineering who were evidently not being ignored as completely as we were. And in fact, later in 2010, at Nagoya in Japan, at the United Nations Convention on Biodiversity, even achieved a moratorium on most types of geoengineering. The Etc. group is headed by the Canadian Pat Mooney. I'm going to play some excerpts from an interview with him we recorded in February. But before I do this, we're going to screen the material that was the starting point for our discussion. We start with some extracts from a European Union publicity film on the extension of the emissions trading scheme to aviation. After that, we play, the, we play part of a BBC publicity film on the effects of aircraft emissions on global temperatures. Air traffic has risen sharply in recent years, and the impact of aviation on climate change is causing increasing concern. Emissions are rising by 4 to 5 percent year on year. Uh, uh, and that is what we are seeing right now. Uh, and if year on year you have 4 to 5 percent growth of emissions, that means in 15 years a doubling. For the European Commission, it's urgent to act, since aviation, unlike other means of transport, is not taxed on fuel. So there's little incentive for it to cut its CO2 emissions. We cannot continue to be successful in one sector and to neutralize that positive result by developments in other sectors. And aviation is one of the most striking examples. The European Commissioner for the Environment wants to see aviation take on its share of the effort to combat climate change. The Commission is therefore proposing to include air transport in the CO2 emissions trading scheme the European Union has pioneered as a means of meeting the Kyoto Protocol objectives. In order to tackle this problem in the most cost-efficient way, uh, we need to include aviation emissions into our highly successful emissions trading scheme. The European Commission sees the emissions trading scheme as the most cost-effective way to control aviation emissions, less expensive than a tax on fuel, for instance. Being in the scheme will push the aviation sector into a new way of thinking that gives as much attention to its environmental performance as to its economic efficiency. Bringing the aviation sector into Europe's emissions trading scheme is expected to lead to big savings in CO2 emissions from aircraft. By 2020, these savings could be 180 million tons annually, twice the level of greenhouse gases Austria emits each year. With this measure, Europe is taking another vital step towards preventing a global climate disaster. As aircraft plow through the upper atmosphere above 26,000 feet, they often leave bright white trails behind them. These long white tails, called contrails, are caused by the water and soot from the aircraft's jet engines. As the hot water and dirt comes out of the engine, it hits the air that it's about minus 40 degrees. It's an explosive reaction. 
Natural cirrus cloud sits at about 26,000 feet and reflects some of the sun's rays away back into space, having a cooling effect on the Earth beneath. When a condensation trail disperses, it turns into a form of cirrus called contrail cirrus. More reflective than natural cirrus, it can spread over an area as big as 60,000 miles. Now more and more scientists have suggested that this contrail cirrus is affecting the temperature of the planet. After the 9-11 attacks in New York in 2001, they were given an opportunity to check this theory. Aircraft across the United States were grounded for three whole days, so that's no contrails for three days. And after all the data was analysed, there was an increase in temperature. A very slight increase, but an increase all the same. And that suggests that contrails cool the planet. The first film says that aircraft emissions are a significant contributory factor to global warming. The second film says that aircraft emissions generate contrail cirrus, which reflects sunlight and has a cooling effect that could mitigate global warming. In other words, the scientific conclusions are diametrically opposed. Now, does this mean that science in general is nothing more than a product of whatever political agenda one happens to have? If one wants to introduce a carbon tax or emissions trading, one says that aircraft emissions are part of a global warming problem, or, and if one wants to promote solar radiation management or geoengineering, one says that aircraft emissions can have a cooling effect and mitigate global warming. Is this an unjustified conclusion? I think it's true to say that, that science uh, is manipulated by politicians all the time. It always has been historically. It's not new that in this particular situation that, that, that uh, you know, what, what's thought to be or presented as sound science is in fact, again, simply the, how uh, a politician chooses to, to play the game. Are you familiar with the term exterminism that was used in the 1980s by members of the non-aligned nuclear disarmament movement to describe the bipolar logic of the Cold War nuclear arms race? Have you heard of this term at all? No, I haven't actually. No. Well, um, it was a term that was in use and I would like to hear your view of uh, what, what I say now, that there are continuities between the bipolar logic of the Cold War nuclear arms race and the bipolar logic that justifies geoengineering. There's an assumption of an intransigent enemy. In, in the Cold War it was called the Soviet Union. Now it's called the right-wing climate change skeptics. And this intransigent enemy forces you to do things that really you prefer not to do, like, like building more and more nuclear weapons or like spraying toxic metals into the atmosphere because the intransigent enemy won't allow you to solve the climate change problem the way you really want to? Now, aren't these two scenarios equally fraudulent? Shouldn't the person who says that anthropogenic climate change is a hoax be the most resolute opponent of geoengineering? Don't people who believe that anthropogenic, anthropogenic climate change is a hoax have even less excuse than ecologists to be tolerant of solar radiation management? Before analyzing Pat Mooney's response, let us remember that the politicization of science is one of the accusations made against climate change activists by climate change skeptics, including many people in our own movement, who often speak as if Greenpeace, Al Gore, the IPCC, have exclusive responsibility for everything unacceptable that is happening, from the carbon tax to emissions trading and to solar radiation management and sulfate aerosols geoengineering. This overlooks the fact that there has, from the beginning, been a division of labor around climate modification, with ecologists advertising global warming as a problem and climate change skeptics advertising geoengineering as a solution to it, even sometimes while simultaneously denying that there is a problem in the first place. This contradiction is to be found even in Edward Teller's pioneering public relations text for geoengineering, Sunscreen for Planet Earth. The well-known and influential climate change skeptic Christopher Monckton, who very persuasively confronts and intimidates climate change activists, is also a supporter of the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, a systematic advocate of geoengineering. I think it should be obvious that faced with this situation, where the unacceptable so-called solutions to anthropogenic global warming 
are being promoted by people who deny that there is even a problem of anthropogenic global warming. It becomes irrelevant which side of the mainstream global warming debate one supports. The first priority is to establish rationality. The irrationality is not only on one side. What is more irrational? To advocate an immensely destructive non-solution to a problem one says does not exist or to successfully lobby for a ban on this activity and then pretend that the ban is being observed when it's not being observed. In October 2010 at the UN Convention on Biodiversity in Nagoya, the etc. group succeeded in having a de facto moratorium imposed on geoengineering projects and experiments. What's your assessment of the value of that moratorium given that it is evidently not being respected? Well, it's, um, we've only had one uh, effort to violate the moratorium since 2010. Oh, sorry, two really. And uh, that we're aware of. Uh, one in, in California and, and one that was uh, thought to be done in, in the UK. The one in the UK was stopped. Um, the one off, off the coast of California was a very small one. And then there was the, the, the crazy characters uh, off the coast of, uh, of Canada as well this last year. That's true. There's a third one. Uh, but the um, I frankly... First, I'd say that the, the major goal for us in pushing the moratorium in Nagoya was to create a political awareness on the part of governments that geoengineering was a serious issue that they had to pay attention to. I think we achieved that. There is an awareness of that. The implication of what Pat Mooney says is that the Nagoya moratorium aimed to make governments aware of geoengineering as a problem. That is desirable and positive. But who is then going to solve the problem? Opposition to geoengineering is not just an academic exercise, because what we are talking about is an ongoing planetary fact. What are its consequences? Ozone depletion, disrupted hydrological cycle, poisoned and sterilized soils and waters, forests and species die off. This is to leave out of account the filaments that have been found in rainwater after spraying in Europe as in the US and have been analyzed by Clifford Carnicom and found to be linked to Morgellons disease. To quote the American activist Dane Wigington, they're doing it because they can, because there's no one to stop them, because at least for the short run, geoengineering is a weapon of unimaginable power. He continues, too many people fail to consider that we're not dealing with reason or sanity in regard to those that run these weather modification, weather warfare programs. This is the same power structure that has detonated over 1,800 nuclear weapons around the globe. The same power structure that sprayed its own soldiers with Agent Orange in Vietnam. The same power structure that uses depleted uranium ammunition in conflicts around the globe. To speak for myself, I came to this subject precisely from the anti-nuclear movements, which in 1991, at the end of the Cold War, threw away the opportunity to break the vicious circle of the nuclear arms race that was presented by the collapse of the Soviet Union. Boris Yeltsin in the Russian Duma on the 3rd of September 1991 proposed 95% unilateral abolition of the Soviet nuclear arsenal. Why didn't the Western anti-nuclear movements second this proposal instead of ignoring it? Belarus, Ukraine and Kazakhstan became nuclear weapons free after 1991. Why didn't Russia become nuclear weapons free also? Was it the Russian government of that time that stopped this from happening? Why should Ukrainians, but not Russians, have the right to live in a nuclear weapons free country? The people who are now appealing to President Obama for a global zero on nuclear weapons, just as the final nail is going into the coffin of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, why didn't they support Yeltsin's proposal in 1991? Of course it's too late now, the opportunity was missed. But why aren't they campaigning now against the militarization of climate? Geoengineering, planet Earth as the latest weapon of war. This is the post-Cold War brainchild of the nuclear weapons laboratories. It should have been and should be at the focus of the anti-nuclear movement's concerns. But at least since the 1987 INF Treaty, these movements have not been connecting with reality. The only exception is the 1999 report on the environment, security and foreign policy. 
Let's hope that the meeting, the recent meeting that took place uh, in the European Parliament, the Skygas meeting, can be a first step towards shaming the anti-nuclear movements because of what they should have been doing and are not doing. Why are the Lord Monktons not addressing issues like this also and not just shooting at the easy target of Al Gore? It's time to extract ourselves from bipolar scenarios of this kind which really reflect nothing more than American party politics projected onto the planet. If Europeans have the necessary political will we can establish a different and better way of behaving. If we set the example for honesty also, perhaps people like Pat Mooney will be motivated to be more frank in what they say publicly.